If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. We'll be picking up in verse 14. Before we read our text, um, I'd like to pray and then just make a couple of uh, opening comments. Father, we love you and we thank you that you have called us from darkness into light. You have called us into your church. You have called us your own and you love us with such a wonderful love, and you have proven that at the cross. Um, no greater love has this than for a man to lay down his life for his friends, and you have done that for us, especially when we didn't deserve it. So that is why we gather. We come together to thank you corporately. We come together to worship you and to uh, glorify your name we come together to love our brothers and sisters because you said that the world would know that we are your disciples by our love for each other and so what a wonderful what a glorious thing this is the church the local assembly and we're so grateful to be a part of it and this morning as we open your word and we uh, desire to be taught by you we ask that you would speak to us in a very special and fresh way that your Holy Spirit, I am convinced, is already moving mightily in this room, would continue on through your word, that you would speak, that we would be encouraged, that we would be challenged, or that you would cut where we need to be cut, that there would be healing where we need to be healed, but that ultimately we would be conformed into the image of your glorious Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So let me just start by saying this is a difficult text, not difficult to understand, but it is uh, a challenging text. Um, it's, it's one that convicts many people, including myself. This message is intended to challenge you. Let me just say that. But it is not intended to guilt you. This is not a guilt trip. All right? We are to come together and we are to stir each other up onto love and good works literally provoke each other. I was talking to the youth about this the other night. Have you ever been provoked to anger? I'm sure we all have. Have you ever provoked somebody to anger? I'm sure we all have. But have you ever provoked somebody to love and good works? Because that's our objective when we come together as a family, and that's my objective here. So please don't take this because there's going to be some, some, I think, maybe some stinging statements made, some, some commentary that I will read. Um, and this is just I want to let the Word of God speak. And uh, I want us all to be mutually encouraged and challenged. Let me say that, you know, I try to make it a habit that when I approach the Scriptures, especially to teach, that I say, Lord, I need to hear from you first. I need to receive from you, okay? This is not about what I'm going to teach the congregation. First and foremost, let it be for me. And then let it be the overflow of my heart. So this is for me, as well as you all. Um, this is a call to follow Jesus in a radical way. A call to be radical for Jesus. Would you consider yourself to be radical for Christ? Is there anything about you or your walk that would um, make you think that? Could anyone look at you and say, man, that person is serious about Jesus. That person loves the Lord. That person is radical. One thing I don't ever want to be guilty of is playing church. Just playing church. This is a conviction that I have had on and off throughout the years, and it has gotten stronger and stronger, especially you know, in the last month, but even, or, you know, several months, but um, last month or so, it's just really been burning in me. So I think this is a timely message. It's a fitting message. So I'm going to read our text, and then we will uh, we'll go back verse by verse. So verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, this is speaking of John the Baptist, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying... The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. 
when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went after him. All right, so back in verse 14, you'll notice the first thing it says is now after John was put into prison. So there's a transition here. You'll remember not long ago, Jesus had just been baptized by John in the Jordan, and then Jesus goes out. Well, there's a lot of information not given us here, and we won't turn there, but in Matthew 14, uh, it's explained to us that John the Baptist was put into prison by Herod because Herod had married his brother's sister, and John, being as bold as he was, openly spoke against that. Now, Herod was afraid of John, and he didn't want to kill him, but he put him in prison. And we do know that eventually, um, through a series of circumstances, Herod's hand was forced, at least he felt it was, and, and John was put to death. But at this point, the scriptures indicate that John has now been put in prison, and Jesus launches out into Galilee to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Now, you guys know I love maps. I think it's uh, very helpful for us to understand the terrain. So if you'll humor me, I have a few maps real quick. Just real quick, I want to kind of work through. And I want to explain uh, a little bit of, of where Jesus is at. Um, but I'm going to start with um, just Israel and how the, the geography changed to the point where Christ was ministering. So guys, if you would put up the first map. So this was the 12 tribes of Israel. They came into the promised land, they conquered, they dispossessed the people, and then they had all of their different allotments. One thing that's significant to realize is Judah here, Simeon is actually inside of Judah, and I'll explain why that's, why that's important in just a moment. So this was how it started. These were the 12 tribes that you so often hear uh, refer to. All right, guys, if you would go to the second map. We know that after Solomon passed away, his son Rehoboam came into power, and there was a split. There was a split, so the 12 tribes went from 12 tribes to two kingdoms. So there were 10, 10 uh, up here, 10 tribes, which was the, uh, the northern kingdom, which was referred to as Israel. And then down here was what is called Judah, and these were two tribes. And the reason that is is because you'll remember Simeon was inside of Judah. They couldn't get out even if they wanted to. So odds are they probably would have left with the other tribes, but that became the, the train. Now, we know that the vast majority of the kings that ruled the north and the south were evil. There were some exceptions, but eventually the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were carried off into captivity. And when that happened, um, if you'll go ahead and go to the next map, the, the, the people that came in and conquered took the majority of the people out, but not all of them. And then they moved some of their own people in. And when people came back from the 70-year captivity, those two kingdoms basically became three regions. So right here, this is basically Israel, and it's split up into Galilee, Samaria, and then Judea. And down here, Jerusalem was the capital um, of Judea. And we all know Samaria, that was the area where um, people were left behind and then people from other nations would come in and they intermarried and then that was where we got the mixed race of the Samaritans, which we know uh, were, were not liked by the Jews. There was really some uh, racial tension that existed there. All right, so when Jesus was ministering in his earthly ministry, this was what Israel looked like. And he spent a lot of his time right up here in Galilee. What, well, there's a reason why I like Galilee so much. They were kind of like, you know how um, in the States now, in the South, we have that country twang. And uh, you can pretty much spot them from, you know, 100 miles away. Well, that was the way it was for the Galileans. Though they were in the North, they were kind of like the, they were the Southerner, the country boys. And uh, it was even obvious by their accent. All right, so one more map. If you would go to the fourth map, this is Galilee, kind of blown up. And as we know, Nazareth, that's where Jesus uh, was raised. Cana, that was where uh, his first miracle, where he turned water into wine. And over here is the Sea of Galilee, where he spends a lot of his time. So towns like Capernaum and Gennesaret, 
those are familiar names to us. So this is where we're at today. So we're all the way up here in Galilee, and we're right here by the Sea of Galilee. And so that's just a quick flyby overview of, of um, how the, the, the makeup of the land came to be what it is and was, and that's where we are at. Now this is Jesus' message. <clears throat> he has launched out into his ministry. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and this is what he says. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, obviously, this is a very condensed version of what Jesus said. I highly doubt that Jesus traveled to a place, stood up, and said this one sentence, and then said amen. Though I'm sure a lot of people would appreciate if, if preachers would follow in that a little more so, a little more closely. The time is fulfilled. The promised one has come. They have been waiting for God's promised one, the Messiah. And Jesus is making it clear, look no further, I'm here, the kingdom of God is at hand. Have you ever wondered what that means, the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God, what is that? Well, God is the king and he is here, and we are his people. We are his loyal subjects. We serve him, so we are uh, very much a part of God's kingdom. God's kingdom is here on earth, and his son, the prince of peace, is reigning. Amen? So Jesus was making it clear, the time has come, the promised one is here, the kingdom of God is among us, so what then? Repent. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. And I'm sure that he didn't just say, believe the gospel, without giving some detail as to what that meant. And I will say that the gospel wasn't even fully realized at this point, because Jesus had not been crucified, he had not been uh, raised from the dead, the Holy Spirit had not come. Uh, so even at this point, it wasn't fully realized, but nevertheless, that was his message. So when I, when I think about this, is that our message? Is that the message that we heard? Is that the message that we share? Repent and believe the gospel. Because where I'm from, the message is, you know, ask Jesus in your heart. Pray a prayer. Say this, repeat after me. Okay, congratulations, now you're in the family of God. And then the masses go out and they don't look anything like Jesus. They don't change. They don't look like they have been filled with the Spirit. What happened? And uh, it, it's a real problem. And so, you know, guys, just being honest with you, I'm uncomfortable at times with the sinner's prayer because I think it can, it can uh, maybe miscommunicate um, Jesus' message was repent. That was the first thing he said. What does that mean? It means to turn. Turn away from those things that have you in bondage, those things that you know are not pleasing to God, but don't just turn away from those things. Turn to God. Turn to the Lord. I think some people get so caught up in what we have turned away from, they don't talk about what it is we turn to. Right? Right? So we turn away from those things that we know are not pleasing to God. And that was the story, that was my, my story. For years, I grew up believing that there was a God, that Jesus is real, this is all truth. But I loved my sin, and I knew it, and I wasn't ready to, uh, to follow Christ. So I didn't pretend and, and make believe like I was. I just, you know, I was scared. There were times where I worried what would happen if I died. Um... But I ultimately chose to live a life of sin. But eventually, I came to that place where I hit rock bottom and I hit it for real. And the Lord was there and I knew that I was ready. Um, I was ready to forsake those things. There was nothing that would stop me now from knowing the Lord. And I was so excited to do that. So I, uh, you know, most of you know, I went to U-Turn for Christ. Uh, it's a Christian-based uh, addictions ministry. This one was in Tennessee. And uh, I got away from everything, and I, I just got by myself on my knees. And I didn't understand all this, but all I knew was I had messed up, and um, I had wrecked my life. I wasn't even capable of leading myself. And um, I believed that there was a God and that He was good and that I needed Him. And I just said, God, if you can, if you will, take this life and put it back together. Do whatever you will with it. I'll follow you. I'm yours from here on out. Um, 
And, and I meant that. I repented of my sins. I believed the gospel. I chose to follow Christ. And it's been a roller coaster. There's been ups. There's been downs, side to side. But the Lord has been with me. And, uh, you know, 11 years later, here I am. Um, and, and in a nutshell, that's my story. So we have to repent, guys. We have to turn from our sins, turn from our ways, turn to the Lord, and believe the gospel. Well, we know what the gospel is, right? It's the most beautiful news in the world. God so loved the world that He gave His Son that whoever believed in Him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Because I was separated from God in my sin, and so were you. And we all know that. But God in His infinite grace paid the price for us so we don't have to pay that price. I don't have to give an account for my sins. My sins were paid for on the cross. They were washed away, moved as far as the east is from the west. And now I know God as my beloved father. And now I'm His beloved child. And now it's the greatest honor to serve Him and to know Him, to walk with Him in love. That's the gospel. And that was what Jesus proclaimed. Is that what we're proclaiming? One more thought about that before I move on. Have you ever tried explaining to somebody that um, they need God and they don't really think they do? They're, they're good. I'm a good person. I'm happy. I'm well taken care of. What do I really need to repent of? I don't steal. I don't cuss. I don't do drugs. I don't do any of that. How about repenting of thinking that you can do it on your own? How about repenting of the arrogance of thinking that you don't need God or that you can get to heaven by your own good deeds? Right? That's kind of a sobering thought. All right, moving on. Verse 16, And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. All right, this is not the first time that Jesus uh, encountered Simon and Andrew. The first encounter actually took place in John chapter 1, verse 35 and 42. We won't go there. This is actually the second time that Jesus is now uh, is, is with them. And there's a much more detailed account of this in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Again, we won't go there, but for your own personal reading... Um, Mark is a very condensed book. It is action-packed. It's immediately this, immediately that, on and on. And you can find more detailed accounts of these stories in the other Gospels. And believe me, there's a lot more to this uh, in Luke, but we won't go there today. But for your own personal study, I would encourage you to do that. Verse 17, Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. I like this, guys. I, I believe that follower may be the best designation for a true believer in Christ. Um, especially where I'm from, Christian can almost just be a social status. Um, it doesn't mean a lot. But to say that you're a follower, uh, to say that um, you, you seek to imitate Christ in all your ways and, and to go where he would have you to go, to do what he would have you to do, uh, you are really, quite frankly, a slave. My life is no longer my own. I've been bought with a price, a very precious price, the blood of Jesus, and now I belong to him. I'm a follower of Christ. It's, it's his will. It's his purpose, his dreams for my life. All right, I would like to read um, kind of a lengthy quote from a Zondervan uh, encyclopedia of the Bible dealing with this idea of following Christ uh, while he was on earth and, and the term disciples and, and followers. So the verb to follow occurs about 80 times in the Gospels and exclusively describes the relationship between the earthly Jesus and his companions. It became a synonym for disciple. This meant, therefore, that every disciple in the strict sense had to leave his occupation, his father and mother, everything, take up his cross and go forward even to death. For the disciple was not above his teacher, and what would happen to the teacher could also happen to the taught. That's pretty radical, isn't it? 
when Jesus walked on the earth and he told someone to follow him, that could mean, literally, leave everything behind. And there were times where we saw that. There were, there were very clear times where we saw that happen. And I'll, I would like to just share with you um, a couple of those instances. So if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. These are three would-be followers of Christ. Three different people that Jesus approaches. One actually comes to Jesus, and then the other two, it would appear, Jesus approaches them. Verse 57, now, as it happened, as they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So this guy, he's eager. He wants to follow Jesus. And he's like, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, are you sure? You sure about that? I might not have anywhere to sleep tonight. You might not have anywhere to lay your head. I might be all that you have. Is that enough? Is Jesus enough? You have to ask yourself that question. I think this flies right in the face of this idea that if we come to Christ, we're going to have all our needs met. I'm not even talking about the prosperity gospel. That's, that's just garbage. To think that God promises you health and wealth, absolutely not. But oftentimes when we want to approach people about Jesus, well, we have to make it appealing, don't we? Don't we have to make it marketable? So what is it that people are looking for these days? Well, they want purpose. They want fulfillment. They want satisfaction. They want to have meaning in life. And, and we tell them that. Or they want freedom from this or freedom from that. And, and we package it as such. People make a profession of faith. They get really excited. They feel very emotional. They have all these expectations that they put on God that were not scripturally warranted. Those expectations are not met. They turn away. So Jesus, right out the gate, said, I just want you to understand that this is not easy. It could cost you everything. You might not have anywhere to lay your head. You still want to follow me? The next one, verse 59. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now, that sounds extremely harsh, does it not? Let's just be honest. Uh, and there are a number of different ideas that have been expressed as to what this could mean. And one of them, I think, is highly likely, and I, I would lean towards that. This guy's father has not actually died. Um, this is actually somewhat of a common saying, um, let me go back, let me tend my father's home and then when he dies and I get my inheritance, then I will come and I'll follow you. So he wanted to go back. He wanted to take care of some other things. He had kind of divided priorities. Jesus was a back burner deal. And Jesus had no time for that. He didn't tolerate that. Um, but at the same time, let me say this. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Let's read the next one and I'll, I'll kind of make the same point. Verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. So this guy just wants to go back and say goodbye to his family. That's it. Just let me go back, say goodbye. And this is Jesus' response. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And it's like, wow, he can't even go back and say bye to his family? Jesus says, anyone who looks back is not fit for the kingdom. I don't want to soften the blow that I believe the scripture was intended to have. Maybe, uh, maybe it's not what it seems. Maybe there is a way to explain this and soften a bit, but I, I don't want to do that. What if Jesus were really asking you to do something like that? Is your love for him that supreme? Is your trust in his goodness that great? Is your desperation to know him and make him known that, that great? Is it? 
I mean, these are serious questions that I have to ask myself. It's sobering to me when I consider these things because I don't consider myself to be great in any way or so strong. Um, I get scared at the thought of these kinds of things. I consider great missionaries of old and now that pay the highest price and they go out and they, they do incredible things, uh, sacrificing themselves, their family. And I think, would I do that? Um, I don't know. I, I hope so. Um, by God's grace and His Spirit. But I believe that's the standard, guys. I believe that's the expectation given in the Scriptures. One other one. Turn back to Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. There's that phrase, follow me. But he was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This guy's possessions were more important to him than Jesus, simply put. He said, how can I have eternal life? Jesus starts naming off all these different commandments. He said, I've kept them all. I've kept all those. There was one in particular that Jesus did not mention. And I think that he was uh, drawing his attention to it. And it was, thou shalt not covet. This guy loved his possessions. He loved his stuff. And Jesus said, get rid of it. Sell it all. Give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven and follow me. And was he willing to pay that price? Was he? No, he was not. He had many possessions. He loved them. And he went away sad. I don't want to go away sad. Do you? I want to do what the Lord asked me to do. And if the Lord is asking me to be radical, and I believe He is, I want to be that. I want to give the Lord exactly what He... Look at what He gave for us. Look at what Jesus did for us. How can we give him any less? How can we just give him the leftovers? How can we just live a, a mundane, ordinary, give a little if I can, maybe serve for an hour here once a month? Never tell anybody about the Lord. That would be embarrassing. We, you know, how, how can we do that? How, how can I do that? All right, so we can't physically follow Jesus. Jesus is in heaven. But do you suppose that his standard has been laxed for us compared to those who were on the earth when he walked the earth? Do you suppose that it's been minimized? I'm taking my youth group right now through a book called Multiply, Disciples Making Disciples. And guys, the things that I'm telling you are things that I tell the youth group. And they, they are excited. They, they are responding to this stuff. I'm, I'm seeing it take root in their lives. So I'd like to read an excerpt from this book that ties right into um, kind of what I'm talking about and the quote that I read from um, that encyclopedia. So, and I quote, It's impossible to be a disciple or a follower of someone and not end up like that person. Jesus said a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. That's the whole point of being a disciple of Jesus. We imitate him carry on his ministry, and become like him in the process. Yet somehow, many have come to believe that a person can be a Christian without being like Christ. A follower who doesn't follow. How does that make any sense? Many people in the church have decided to take on the name of Christ and nothing else. This would be like Jesus walking up to those first disciples and saying, Hey, would you guys mind identifying yourselves with me in some way? Don't worry, I don't actually care if you do anything I do or change your lifestyle at all. I'm just looking for people who are willing to say they believe in me and call themselves Christians. That's pretty heavy, huh? Um, 
That was not what Jesus said, was it? We just, we just heard what, what Jesus had to say to people who wanted to follow after him. So I just want to take a moment. I've talked a little bit about the, the, the expectation, uh, and it, it's a radical one, but how about the why? Let's just drop back for a second and talk about why. Why did they follow Jesus? Why would they want to, and why, why should we? Why would we? I think it's important that we understand that. So first off, I think sometimes we take for granted that Jesus would just walk up and say, follow me, and these disciples would just drop everything and go. I mean, it's kind of weird if you think about it. If, if we were in here and someone walked in the door and said, you know, I'm the son of God, follow me, we would be like, well, that guy is crazy. And, I mean, we just wouldn't do that. So... Um, it's amazing to me that they would, they would do that in the first place. Um, but the reality is, is that they were anticipating a Messiah. They were waiting on God's sent one to come. They've been waiting for thousands of years. This has been prophesied all throughout the scriptures. And it was ripe for that at that time, just because of everything that was going on uh, politically and in the religious world. But they had a very limited understanding of why the Messiah was coming. Because there are very mixed prophecies in the Bible. Some would allude to the fact that he was going to be a conquering, reigning king. And some of them alluded to the fact that he would suffer for many. And it would get rather confusing. But they had it in their mind that Messiah would come and he would throw off the yoke of Rome and he would restore Israel back to their glorious day. And they thought that by getting in with him on the front end would mean certain power and they would be able to reign with him. And we know that they asked at times if they could sit on his right and left side uh, when he was established in his kingdom. They didn't get it. Um, they had a limited understanding and it, it would appear that that was what they were kind of going after. Though Jesus told them time and time again why he came. He told them over and over they just didn't get it. But you know what? They did. They got it eventually. Eventually they came to understand exactly why Jesus came. That he came to live, to die, to be raised from the dead, to set the captives free from sin, to give us eternal life with God in heaven and with him. And the disciples understood that when the Holy Spirit came. And they received the Spirit of God. They were born again. They understood these things. And they continued on with the Lord. And it got harder. Many of them suffered horrific deaths. Beheaded, crucified, seeing their families crucified. I mean, you name it. All of them except John the Apostle were martyred to death. But John was still uh, persecuted greatly. And they still did not turn away from the Lord because they knew. They knew that he was the Lord. He was the King. And they loved him. They loved him. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. So what causes us to follow Jesus? What would cause one of us to pay a price like that, to just forsake everything and to follow him? Well, you know, I will say we have a greater understanding now than the disciples did. We really don't have any excuse. Uh, we have a very thorough and comprehensive understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do and what Jesus will return to do. Uh, and what we also understand very clearly from the scriptures is there is no other way, talking about eternal life, there's no other way by which a man can be saved except through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So we, we have that reality hanging over us. Where else can we go? Where else can we go? Nowhere. We only have Jesus to hope in. He alone is the one who is able to pay for our sins and to uh, ensure us a place in heaven with God. That in and of itself is a great motivation, and that is one where most people, that's where they start. That's where most people start. They're, they're afraid of hell, right? Any sane person would be, and they don't want to go there, and they understand that Jesus is the only way, and that's what happens. They accept the Lord. But guys, I would say that's a very, that's just a, a, an introductory um, um, kind of thought towards the Lord. It's, it's, it's base. It's not the highest motivation. The greater reason is love. I love the Lord. 
right? I remember early on in my walk, I was talking with a brother, an older brother in the Lord, and we were discussing the idea of the fear of God and being motivated by, by fear. And he said, that's good and all, and a lot of people start there, but it's not the supreme motivation. Love is. Fear doesn't really stop us from doing a lot of the things that we want to do, right? I, I, I had a, many years there where I was breaking the law regularly, and I was afraid of the police, and I was afraid of jail, but it didn't stop me, right? It's a weak motivation. But our love for God, that is supreme. And so, as I have come to know Jesus, to know Him is to love Him. And the more I know Him, the more I love Him. And the more I understand His faithfulness, the more dedicated I am to go deeper and to want to serve Him in a greater way and to want to take greater risks and to sacrifice in other ways and to take bigger faith steps and to go out there and really give Him my life. You understand? Because I love the Lord. That's why I follow Him, because I understand what He has done for me. And I understand that not only has He saved me, that blows me away that God would save me. But you know what really amazes me? That He would be so patient with me until this very hour. Because I don't know about you guys, but I just blow it all the time. And God still loves me. And He's still for me. And He's still, you know, with me. And that, I, you know, what a great love, you know? And, and how can you not love Him when you, when you understand that? All right. So having said that, it starts with us. We repent, we believe, we're changed, we commit to follow Christ, we commit to give Him everything, to not hold anything back. But it doesn't stop there. Now we're commissioned. Now we're supposed to go out and make disciples. Now we're supposed to go out and fish for men. This is the part where I get uh, especially um, convicted at times. He said, Jesus said, that if you follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. If you follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. Sounds to me like what he's saying is that if you are a follower of Christ, what will naturally flow out of that is that you will fish for men. You will catch people for Jesus. You will go out and share the love of Christ, and you will try to lead people into this. But for whatever reason, this seems to be the one thing in particular that the vast majority of us don't do. And I've talked about this. Just because I'm up here sharing with you guys, I don't consider that the same thing. You guys came here expecting to hear this. I didn't go out and, and get you. I didn't walk up to you and, and share with you. It's, it's something altogether different. So I can't fool myself into thinking that I'm doing my job. Right? I'm, I'm with you guys in this, and this is very hard for me. Um, but I'll just ask the question, do we try to catch people for Jesus? Do we, are we fishers of, of men? Do we? Have we ever? Do we ever even think about that? So let me just say, I'm a fearful guy. I've spent the majority of my life um, trying to avoid embarrassment, right? That's, that's kind of where, where I have always been. It is not natural for me even to be up here. I'll just be very honest with you about that. Um, it used to be so bad at my church in Tennessee when they first started having me come up and do announcements um, I mean, it was terrible. I mean, it was bad. I'm just sweating bullets and shaking, and I can hear my voice trembling over the, the speaker. And, and I mean, the first time I got off the stage, I literally thought about running out the door and just running down the street, just mad, you know. Um, and I had to work through that. And it was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that, man. I'm not going to, you know, forget it. I can't get up there and teach and do any of that. I'm just going to hide back in my little hole in the youth room and do my little youth studies, and that's fine for me. Um, but, you know, the Lord really kind of brought me through that. Um, I remember one time, okay, I'm up, I'm, I'm, telling, I'm giving the announcements, everyone has their bulletins, they're following along, and I, I looked around and nobody was looking at me. Everybody was looking down. And I, have you ever been so embarrassed when someone is embarrassed, you feel embarrassed for them and you, like, can't look at them? So that's what I thought was going on. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, they can't even look at me right now. I was like, this is crazy, man. So anyways, afterwards, I, um, I was talking to my pastor, and I was like, dude, I can't do this anymore. I was like, they, they couldn't even look at me. And he said, Rob, you just told them to look at their bulletins. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, okay, I forgot. And so, I mean, that's how it was for me. And I, I say all that to say, you know, I just purposed early on in my walk that I was going to live a life outside of my comfort zone. That, that was, my understanding was that is just the way that it was to be. And so um, I didn't want to be controlled by fear anymore, even though I might be scared, I might be super nervous. I want to step out in obedience and do it anyways. You know, and so that's been my objective. Um, and I just I say that because this doesn't come naturally for me either. So this is easier for me even still than going out and just walking up to a stranger on the street and trying to engage them for the gospel. That's a whole nother level. Um, but guys, honestly, I can't shake it anymore. At this point, I'm, I'm willing to do anything. So we've been doing new things, and we've started out gradual. Uh, the coffee ministry, you know, that's not threatening at all, right? So we're just giving people a cup of coffee, and uh, they love it. They receive that. And then we walked over to the soccer field one evening, a, a couple families in the church, and uh, someone had that idea to just start giving pizza out to the soccer kids over there. And, man, they loved it. The kids loved it, as you would imagine. And the soccer coaches just thought that was such a sweet thing. And so we've just been thinking, how can we start taking little steps to get out there and meet people and, and develop relationships? And so... Uh, and then even beyond that, the other day, my wife and I decided that we were, we were just going to go out and we're just going to start telling people directly about the gospel and handing out tracts, the whole nine. Um, and, and we did. And it was scary and um, it was awesome. You know, I had, had some really sweet opportunities. Um, I feel like the Lord blessed that. And, you know, that's, that's just the beginning of it because it would be real easy for me to say, okay, I did that. Okay, I got to do that real quick before I preach this message on fishing uh, for men so I can feel like I did it, and then I don't have to do it anymore, right? So it's a constant battle for me, guys, daily. It's like I want to be radical for Jesus. Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers for men. So, you know, I'm still thinking, what next, what next, what next? I don't want to go back. I want to gain ground for Jesus, amen? We want to keep moving forward. So that's just a little bit of a personal testimony of, of kind of how it's been for me along the way and even, even now. Um, but I would just say some simple, practical things that, that we can start doing to be radical. I think one is really fasting, man. Who, who fasts? Um, that's not something that I do very often, but fasting for the lost, fasting and praying for the boldness to go out. How about giving sacrificially for the gospel? Obviously, I believe we should be giving to our church financially. The church has had my back over the years. They've been there for me when nobody else was, and I want to give back to the church so that they can continue to do that work for others, right? But I think in addition to that, we can be giving to the, the, the cause. We support missionaries here in this church. Um, the Pebbleers, would you raise your hands? Please, I'm not trying to call you all out, but they're getting ready to, are you going to the Ukraine? Is that correct? You know what? Their information is in there on the board. You want to support the gospel? You can give, all right? Um, there are different organizations um, sharing our faith one-on-one -on -one with people, inviting people to church, sitting down with people that you know and just checking on them. How are you doing? How can I, can I pray for you? Can I encourage you? Small group, small groups, right? We have life groups here where we gather together and, and we know what those are and we're going to have more information about that out in the foyer soon. But um, you know what, guys? You don't have to do some big official thing. You could just grab a few of your brothers and sisters, friends, come together, pray, pray for these things, pray for each other, pray for the lost, and then consider how you can start inviting people into that. Um, it doesn't have to be some big official ministry launch. It could just be something that happens very organically with you and a couple of friends who have a burden and, and start gathering together and praying and trying to bring people into that. So verse 19, 
When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. James and John, we know them uh, very well. Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder. They were well-known fishermen. Their father had a very successful business. It says they were mending their nets. That's a really interesting phrase. It's actually used in Ephesians to speak of the pastor's work. So as they were mending their nets to uh, prepare to go out and catch fish, same exact phrase is used of pastors in Ephesians 4. Our job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That word equip, same phrase. So it's our job to train you guys to do the work of the ministry, to go out and to catch people, to bring people in, all right, to do the work of the ministry. Verse 20 and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So that's all it took. Jesus came up, said, follow me. They left it all. They left something substantial, and they did it immediately. So let me just close with this. Is God calling you to let go of something? Is there something that is holding you back from walking in the fullness of this, from going radically after Jesus? I can think of a number of things that might hold someone back. Pride. I'm not going to allow myself to be embarrassed. Fear of man. I'm too scared of what they're going to think of me or what they might say or do. Love for the things of this world. Well, you know, all my time, all my energy, all my effort is given towards stuff. I want to have more things. I want to live a comfortable life. Safety and security is what matters to me. I'm not worried about building God's kingdom. I'm more busy building my own, right? I want to have nice things. I want to have security, safety, so on and so forth. Maybe a love for the things of this world is holding you back. Maybe it's position. Maybe you're trying to climb that ladder and everything you've got is going towards that. You don't really have time for the kingdom. You don't have time to reach out. This one right here might be a little touchy, so I'm going to say this as gently as I can. This is directed more towards the youth. You know what the biggest issue I have in the youth ministry is? Little league. Soccer, football, baseball, you name it. I mean, I, it's very rare that all my kids are there at the same time because they're out doing sports. They're out worshiping at the altar of football. You know? foot bail, and um, that's something that I have to contend with on a regular basis, and it's frustrating, and I know that when my daughter gets older, we're going to want her swimming, we're going to want her doing soccer, we're going to want her doing all that, and I'm going to have to hold back on that. You know what? I'm going to have to hold back on that because there are other things that come first. Jesus comes first, all right? Um, so that, that's, that's another one. Um, that seems to be kind of a big one. So anyways, those are just some thoughts off the top of my head, things that could easily hold us back from following Jesus and going out and doing what he told us to do. So I would, let's take our cue from the disciples and let's, uh, let's drop our nets. Let's just do it and do it immediately. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. I'll close in prayer. Worship team, if you'll come up. We would like to make some people available up here to pray for you. Guys, y'all know who, who, who you are. You're up here uh, regularly praying, so I'd encourage you to come on up. If you need prayer in any of these areas, please come up. Repent of your sins. Cry out to God. Confess those things. Forsake them here. Forsake them now. Commit yourselves to go out and to serve Jesus in a radical way. Because... Well, when it's all said and done, we want to hear those words, don't we? Good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much. We love you. We praise you. Um, we just ask for the grace to do these things, to be gripped by these things, um, and the power to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.